Good afternoon. On behalf of the Inter-American Development Bank, we welcome you to the event, an investment strategy for the COVID-19 vaccine in Latin America and the Caribbean. A conversation between IDB President Luis Alberto Moreno and Michael Kremer, professor at Harvard University and the 2019 co-recipient of the Nobel Memorial Prize in Economics. The event will be in English with interpretation into Spanish. Para escuchar el evento en español, haga clic en el icono del mundo que encontrará en la parte baja de su pantalla y seleccione el idioma. Please send your questions to policy at iadb.org. President Moreno, please go ahead. Well, good afternoon, everybody, and it's a real pleasure to have with us uh, today Professor uh, Michael Kramer and uh, his group, who I will introduce a bit later. But let me just at the outset begin by saying that there's nothing more important to deal with the pandemic of COVID-19 than the development of a safe and effective vaccine. The IMF, for instance, estimates that the, there's about a $375 billion monthly loss to the world economy because of this pandemic. And Latin America and the Caribbean the, the economic output is projected to fall by $43 billion every month between 19, 2020 and 2021. So we know that the world will need at least 7 billion dos doses of the vaccine. And this, of course, is of a scale never before seen. And countries uh, do not have this kind of production capacity that is currently in place. So the question is, how can we pre-purchase vaccines? And there's a lot of work that has been done around this by Gavi, by CEPI, by others. And certainly we at the Inter-American Development Bank are looking how we can help on a massive scale, to help finance countries uh, which are largely middle income, which mo most of the world is not looking at, uh, to see how they can have access to the vaccine. Because the reality is that if you don't have some kind of pre-purchase agreement of the vaccines, you might have to wait for a year or more. We all remember the race for the ventilators. This would be nothing. It will tell in comparison what the race for the ventilators has been. So the question is how we can get a, a, around the questions of, of group purchasing. How can we lower the risk? How can we leverage buying power and obtain a greater production capacity? These are some of the challenges for, especially for middle income countries and for all countries as a whole. There's already a lot of work being done for the poorest countries. A lot of that work typically has been done, uh, among others, by, by Gavi. Today, having the pleasure of having Professor Michael Kramer, which will present the advanced market commitment model, which basically uh, is a way to successfully accelerate the development of the new model, uh, the, the vaccine. He will explain how the model can be adapted to, uh, he did this for the Nomoco a vaccine and how can this same model be adapted to COVID to generate incentives for both manufacturers to start building large capacity uh, needed to supply the vaccines to the world. Essentially, what is the push and pull factors that one has to uh, develop? Um, and of course, uh, how can we do this uh, better uh, in, in Latin America? And so with that, uh, knowing how time sensitive this is, we need to start to act now. Uh, we need a process of international cooperation, which can help us ensure how to best get the vaccine. And we are, of course, at the IDB. Uh, this is basically part of our DNA. We want to help in this process, and we've already done a lot of work. And today, I'd just like to, again, welcome Professor Michael Kramer, uh, who will be together with Juan Camilo Castillo and, and Susan Affi, uh, who have been actually helping in the development of the model that he has for Latin America. So. I know, uh, Professor, you want to make a presentation and then we'll start uh, a conversation. Over to you and thank you so much again for being with us. Oh, thank you so much. It's a, it's a real pleasure to be here. Uh, why not see if I can share my slides? Uh,
Okay. Uh, so this is a joint work with a, with a, a, a large group of people. Um, Susan Athey is here. Uh, um, uh, Juan Camilo Castillo is also, also joining us. Uh, Rachel Glenister at DFID, uh, Gene Lee at the World Bank, Chris Snyder at Dartmouth, uh, Alex DeBarak at George Mason, Brandon Tan at Harvard, and I think I forgot Arthur Baker also. Um, so many of us, as, as, as you just heard, many of us worked on a previous vaccine. Uh, um, uh, we, there was a, we developed a concept for um, something called an advanced market commitment to encourage the development of a new type of vaccine for pneumococcus. So pneumococcus is a disease that you know, is killing a million people a year. Um, and there were vaccines already for the strains that were common in uh, high-income countries, but not for the strains that were common in low-income countries. So the, the idea in that case was for a group of funders to promise in advance that if, if a vaccine were developed that, uh, that was effective against those strains, uh, there would be a market, and then that would encourage the, uh, the development of such a vaccine. Um, so they would promise to help purchase, finance the purchase of the vaccines. Um, we think that there are some similarities in this case, um, but there are also some differences. I guess I, I should have explained. That was adopted, a number of countries came together, they made a $1.5 billion advanced market commitment, and uh, now three vaccines have been developed against the strains of pneumococcus in developing countries, and those, those vaccines are reaching you know, hundreds of millions of people. So. Um, you know, we certainly hope that we get to the same uh, point for COVID-19. And um, what, we, what this group formed, uh, including people from, you know, who'd worked on that plus others, um, the idea is to think about the specific economics of the COVID-19 case, which we'll argue um, has some important differences. Okay. So as you heard, the economic losses are tremendous uh, from, from COVID-19. Uh, the most recent estimates that we could find from an international institution were these World Bank estimates of 12 trillion in economic losses uh, over this 2020-2021 period. And that works out to $500 billion. And at least as a crude approximation, um, you might think that every month that we accelerate vaccine development will corresponds to $500 billion in economic gains, just, you know, taking that 12 trillion and dividing by, by 24 months. Um, if you look at this for Latin America, you get 41 billion. Obviously you could quibble with these numbers a little bit, um, but the point is these are enormous numbers. Now, if we think about the normal process for development of vaccines, it's a very slow and time consuming process. And that's at least in part because the, the capacity installation for factories takes place, that's a very complicated process. Vaccine manufacturing is, a, is much more complicated than a normal drug manufacturing. And that only takes place, the capacity is only installed after the trials are completed because companies are typically not eager to uh, incur that type of expenditure for large scale capacity when, there's a, when, they, when they don't know whether their vaccine will succeed. And, and many vaccines do, do fail in trials. What's more, even after the capacity, even after testing is done and they're installing capacity, they typically build a fairly limited capacity, serving only the high income countries initially. And there's typically pretty long delays, a decade or more before all countries are served. So there's a number of reasons in terms of economic theory why that even though that's what firms will privately do on their own, that might not be socially efficient. The private and, and social incentives may differ. And just to discuss some of the, the, uh, the, the, uh, some of the market failures involved, it, there's, um, that, that may mean that private incentives, both for accelerating capacity construction, doing it simultaneously with testing, and expanding capacity, putting in a large capacity, which allows a, a large flow of the vaccine to be produced to treat people much more quickly and avoid um, or, or minimize shortages. Um, the private incentives to do that will likely be less than the social value. 
Um, and there are a number of reasons for that. In classic economic theory, disease externalities. If I take the vaccine, that doesn't just benefit me, but it benefits others. In the case of COVID-19, there are also spillover economic benefits. If I can go out and interact with others, um, that may benefit others economically as well as me. Now, because of that, um, um, because of the individual incentives are not, not, um, not aligned uh, with, with national incentives or, or global incentives, typically vaccines are purchased by governments. But that creates its own set of issues. One is that um, I think from a purely financial point of view, if a firm installs enough capacity just to serve the high income countries, it can sell at a pretty high price. If there's enough capacity in the world to serve middle and low income countries, that could put pressure on prices. So that's one, one issue that may create a further distortion. But there's also the issue that there can be political limitations on prices. And I think that particularly may be relevant for COVID-19. And maybe we can come back to that later. Now there are some potential effects that could go in the opposite direction. Um, business stealing effects that might mean, but I think those are likely much smaller. There's, if you look at the one sort of prima facie piece of evidence that the, that firms don't capture all of the value from, from vaccines is if you look at the reaction of the stock market to vaccine news. You know, when the first um, positive news started coming out on vaccines, you saw a jump in the, in the price of the stock of the companies that were making the vaccines. But that gain in value was tiny relative to the overall gain in the stock market value. And of course, the gain to the total economy is presumably much larger still. So from the standpoint, I'm going to move you know, away from theory to some calculations. But from the point of view of the, the economic theory, there's lots of reasons to think that firms might not um, move as quickly as would be socially valuable, and they might not move at the capacity levels that are socially valuable. So to so switch from, you know, this, uh, from economic theory to you know, actual policy, what's happening in the world right now? Well, um, you know, the US through Operation Warp Speed and Europe through uh, an, an this, various initiatives are purchasing vaccines in advance of approval. So whereas the normal process is firms wait till install capacity until the testing is complete, what the US have done and what a number of European countries have done is they've contracted with the firms and say, we're gonna pay you up front. This is a little bit different than what the pneumococcus advanced market uh, case, but what, what they've done is they say, we'll pay you up front and we want you to install the capacity now, and we're pre-purchasing the doses, and we're taking on that risk. So the buyers are saying, yes, we know the vaccine may fail. If it fails, we're still paying you, but if it succeeds, we want the vaccine. So, you know, I argued on theoretical grounds that private and social incentives might not correspond. But if we look at these actual programs, you know, are they a good deal? Well, let's, you know, I, I don't have access to the full contracts, but, I, um, but reading the newspapers, you can get the basic terms. So the US paid AstraZeneca. Um, that's a firm that's uh, producing um, probably what's perhaps the leading vaccine right now, um, which is the uh, vaccine developed by Oxford University. Um, they, they contracted for $1.2 billion for 300 million doses, basically purchasing for you know, everybody in the U.S. who might, might want a vaccine. So was that a good deal? Well, if you can build the capacity, um, um, if you can build the capacity during the trials rather than waiting till afterwards, you know, let's say that accelerates vaccination of the population by six months. Let's say that the success probability were only 10%. You know, I hope it's more, but you know, let's take be conservative. Let's say it's, a, it's only 10%. What would be the benefit cost ratio? Well, we estimate that would be 45. That's just because the gain, the gain from accelerating, um, accelerating the available, as I said in the first slide, the gain from accelerating availability of the vaccine is so, so large. Now, you could do another calculation. That's just, you know, that's just one shot on goal. Imagine you had um, 
think just do the, yeah, this is very crude, what we do in the papers, um, I hope more sophisticated, certainly more complicated, um, but take the case that these were all independent draws and that there were a bunch of candidates, there's you know, more than 100 candidates out there. If all vaccines had a 10% chance of success and they were independent draws, it'd be worth taking 37 shots on goal. Um, that would, before, um, you know, that's, that's a level of investment that would be worthwhile, even though that 37th vaccine obviously only increases the odds of a successful vaccine by a small amount. Just given the tremendous value of a vaccine, uh, of a successful vaccine, it turns out that you know, quick uh, back of the envelope calculation would suggest that. Let's think of that as, a, as just giving you a sort of order of magnitude sense of this. Um, so that was a calculation for the US. What about uh, uh, LAC countries? Well, you know, we've done a similar, again, very crude calculation for Peru. For Peru, accelerating a vaccine by six months would be worth 5.6 billion. So that would be worth it. Uh, Peru buying this vaccine for all citizens would be worth it as long as the chance were at least 2.1%. And obviously, and you know, as you'll hear later, we, we estimate based on the historical record that the chance is, is much greater than that. So these are very, you know, in some ways these are, are these very simple calculations, I think, you know, tell you a lot. Um, I should emphasize that it's, you know, another option. Let's say that for some reason it was difficult to buy for the whole population. Or suppose we're thinking about a very low income country, lower income than Peru. Um, you know, a, a Haiti, for example. Well, a lot of the benefit, a lot of the health benefit of vaccines comes from re vaccinating health workers and the elderly and other you know, vulnerable groups or key workers. Um, so another option for, for low-income countries or might be to not buy doses for their whole population, but only for the key groups, and maybe for 20% of the population or, or possibly even less. So... And of course, another option for a middle income country would be to say, well, we'll buy, you know, some candidates that we think are very likely to succeed. We will, or most likely to succeed, we'll buy for the whole population. Others will make a smaller order so we can at least uh, get coverage for the, if, if it turns out that one's successful, we'll at least get uh, coverage for the, for the most vulnerable members of our population. Um, um, so let me, give you a, a sense of what we'll what I'd like to talk about. Um, by the way, Susan Camillo, feel free to, to come in as, as uh, seems fit. Um, let me give a little bit more background on the, on the vaccines. Talk about uh, what might happen in a decentralized market for early access to vaccines. Um, describe the equilibrium. Briefly say a bit about a, a, few, a few other issues as well. I probably won't cover all of this, but we can come back in Q&A. So the model that we do, in some ways, is a more sophisticated uh, calculation, uh, 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 version of the calculation of, that I described earlier. We use data from World Health Organization on a, you know, around 100 vaccine candidates. WHO has data on the stage of development. What level of testing has, this, has each vaccine gone through? Also on the platform, there are many different platforms. There's, protein subunit ones, there's viral vectors, there's mRNA, DNA. And some of these, there's, you know, a lot of more experience for some are, you know, brand new. You know, based on the historical record of candidates at similar stages, um, based on the platforms, uh, based on some you know, expert opinion, although you know, that differs, and with some downward adjustments, uh, because we're wondering, could a candidate be ready in 18 months? we assign some probabilities of success. And I should say, you know, that's a somewhat subjective exercise, but uh, we, we try to do the best job we can, but we're also working on uh, developing a, a version of this that so that users could, could uh, put their own assumptions in and see how the, results, how the results change. We also allow for correlation of risks. You know, that, that, uh, that simple exercise I did before was assuming that all the candidates were independent, but of course they're not. Um, candidates, you, know, you might get a whole platform that uh, turns out to be not, not workable for some reason. Um, 
And then we also use some cost estimates, and these are based on discussions with various sources in industry as well as in bodies like uh, like CEPI, which is is a um, um, I'll, I'll explain more about them, but they're they're on the buyer side and some on the public side. What are some of the institutions um, that are involved? I think that's useful background. Obviously, for the Americas, the Caribbean, uh, PAHO is a, is plays a key role in buying vaccines on behalf uh, collectively on behalf of the region. Um, Gavi buys vaccines on behalf of low and lower middle income countries. Uh, but mostly, historically, mostly the very poorest countries, so not most of the countries in the region. Um, Gavi is, set, is setting up something called the COVAX facility, um, and that is, has a, um, two components, or the, the plan is it will have two components. One, which is a funded component, which would be financed from donations from the uh, higher income countries, and that would cover some countries in the region, Haiti, Bolivia, um, El Salvador, and so on. But most of the countries in the region wouldn't be included because they're a, too, the, their income levels are too high uh, to, to qualify for that. And therefore, they would fall into what's called the self-pay component. So Gavi's plan is for the COVAX facility is that countries in this, you know, that are not the poorest countries are going to have to pay themselves. Now, that leaves... Uh, I think most of the region in this very awkward situation. Some high income countries, you know, the US, UK, a, a number of European countries working together, have gone out and they're signing these contracts they've described. They've already signed them and they're signing more. Um, the very lowest income countries. There are already some pledges, uh, not enough, and I hope there will be more, but there are already some pledges um, from international donors to the, the funded part of the COVAX facility. But ironically, the place where the epidemic is most severe at the moment, uh, the Latin American Caribbean region, that primarily is not covered by either of these, which means that there's a real danger of being left out and um, you know, that's why I feel I'm so excited to be talking here because I think um, um, this is really the, this is where, um, this is both where the problem is most intense and where the institutional solutions are, are most lagging. Okay. Um, so let me mention CEPI a little bit since I referred to it before. CEPI um, makes some investments in the, in the, um, in the, research and in the um, in, and in manufacturing of, of vaccines um, as well. Okay. Um, Nick actually explained one more thing about, um, about the uh, vaccine manufacturing process. So the vaccine manufacturing process includes you know, many different um, components, but some of these components um, are in fairly short supply. So um, and particularly, they may be very difficult to expand the supply in the very short run. Long run, you could set up more manufacturing facilities for components like bioreactors, et cetera, but that might be difficult in the short run. So let me, let me that takes us into the, the next, um, next section of the talk. Um, we tried to think about what would happen with a decentralized market for early access to vaccines, because that's a large part of what we see now with countries like the US or UK going out and signing deals uh, on, on basis on behalf of their countries. And so the, the issue is, you know, I just argued before that it's clearly worth it, not just for the US, but also for middle income countries to go out and sign deals like the, like the AstraZeneca deal that the US signed. But, <laughs> There may be, that's true in a partial equilibrium if we take the prices as fixed, but there's a question, is there enough vaccine for all countries to buy? And when we talk to experts, they're very concerned about the, they, if, you, if you talk to the experts in the industry, they actually believe that there are capacity constraints on many of these inputs. And that it's gonna be very difficult to supply the whole world. Now, I think economists normally think that there may be more elasticity out there or than, uh, than sort of engineers do. Um, 
but um, but I think we should recognize that it is just very hard to to rapidly expand uh, capacity. And so in the short run, supply may well be pretty inelastic. Um, what happens when you have very high demand and inelastic supply? Well, you get very high prices. <laughs> now, what I think we don't know is how the politics of this is going to work out. There, there may be pretty strong political pressure to keep prices low. And that might that might mean that the price might be below the marginal social value of the vaccine. So standard, standard economic analysis would say the price would go very high um, and you'd get a, a bidding war for this. And you may, but you may also get certainly AstraZeneca, you know, they're charging $4 a dose. That's not, um, that's not a super high price right now. Maybe that's just a short run uh, phenomena because we haven't had the capacity constraints, but maybe there's also some, some uh, either, um, desire by companies to uh, not be seen to be profiteering or some implicit threat of, of price regulation. I'll come back to this later, but we've done analyses both ways. I'm going to show you a case today where we assume um, average cost pricing, that there's some political pressure that keeps prices at the average cost rather than the, the marginal cost as we would normally assume, but uh, prices could be much, you know, much higher than this. Okay. Um, as I said in, in the introduction, you know, those were actual deals that were done today. If it's possible to buy at those prices, that's clearly a good deal. Um, we can, you know, happy to talk later about what happens if, if prices were high or to share the model. Okay, so what do we do to look at the decentralized model? We assume that every country can contract to purchase capacity from each of several different vaccine candidates. They have to pay a certain price to do that. We'll assume that the, cat, the manufacturer for a particular candidate, what's, that what's being purchased is capacity. So it's a little bit different in our, in our model than in the example I gave. It's not purchasing a certain number of doses. It's saying, we're gonna buy the capacity of this bioreactor. We're gonna fund to put the bioreactor in. And then um, and, you know, we can get the output from that if, if it turns out the vaccine's successful in trials. And the, let's, we then solve for the optimal investment for each country. And that's, there's two parts to that. How many candidates to invest in and how, how much capacity to order for each candidate. Um, we've, we've made some, I would say, relatively optimistic assumptions compared to what we've heard from some of the people in industry about the, the, the place at which, you know, the, the, uh, the extent to which you can expand capacity before costs really start to go up because, for example, you need to start repurposing capacity that's been used for, for other things that have a high, high marginal cost of uh, repurposing. So, um, um, and as I said, I'm going to show the case where, the, where we assume the price is the average cost plus a 20% markup, but you know, we've also worked out the case with standard marginal cost pricing or marginal cost plus some markup. Uh, we can we can do as well. Okay. What are countries buying when they're when they're buying early capacity? Well, they're buying earlier access to the vaccine. So if you think about the case without early purchase, there'd be the medical trials. Then once those are finished, the capacity is installed, and then there's production. And you know what the early purchase enables is the capacity to be installed. If you see that red line at the at the same time as the medical trials are being conducted, which means the production starts earlier. So we're looking at the incremental value of getting the, getting the production earlier. Okay. Um, or getting the output, getting the vaccines earlier. Let's see if I can advance the next slide. Okay. Um, what's the benefit of, of in, to look, when we solve the problem, how much capacity should, could, should countries invest in? You know, the benefit is the more candidates they invest in, the greater the chance of success. So if you and, and just invest in a few candidates, you choose the ones with the highest probability of success. Uh, or, um, and then as you increase the number of candidates, you're going to more and more marginal candidates. And obviously, you're, you're, there's always the chance that one of the early candidates succeeded already. So you're getting, this tends to be a fairly concave, concave function of the, the probability of success as a function of the number of candidates. So it's a 
it's a very easy decision, as I argued earlier, to, to take at least you know, one shot or, or two or three shots on goal or five shots on goal. But the richest countries wind up um, uh, to anticipate the results of it. They wind up saying, we're going to take a lot of shots on goal. Um, the other choice is how many doses, how, many, how much capacity. And there, the benefit of more capacity is you get uh, investing more capacity is you get, um, if you, you, you get the, your population vaccinated more quickly. What do we assume for the benefits? Well, we take the World Bank estimates of the economic harm. We, uh, we do the health benefits. We actually, um, we're probably underestimating the health benefits because for the region, because we just assume 150K deaths per month. Um, obviously, the better, you know, more favorable scenarios, more pessimistic scenarios, but we think there's a right tail there, so we use that. But I said this is probably an underestimate for the region because we don't, um, we don't, we, we're not assuming that those are, are we, we have a common, single common worldwide death rate. And obviously the region is, at least right now, is suffering uh, terribly badly. Uh, we don't know what will happen, when, uh, what that will be when, when the vaccine, when or if a vaccine becomes available. And then we also allow for the, um, the fraction of the population at particularly high risk. One thing I should note is we allow for 50% probability that either treatment or some other mitigation strategy, maybe we find a, um, a very good testing and test and trace strategies. We allow for 50% probability that that problem is entirely solved of, of COVID-19 before a vaccine is developed. And as you'll see, we still calculate it makes sense to make very large investments. I think that's the, the logic for that should be clear from the initial examples. The benefits are so overwhelming with the sort of 45 to one benefit cost ratio that even if there's some chance that you know, a vaccine, um, that by the time we have a vaccine, it'll be, it'll be unnecessary. It's still worth, it's still worth you know, when you buy insurance, uh, it's, it's worth it, even though there's only a certain chance that you'll, you'll need to use it. Um, this slide just shows our, the assumptions we make about the benefits to the priority workers and to the elderly um, um, based on some, you know, our understanding of the epidemiology. We assume that you get 75% of the benefits from the priority populations. Let me just uh, mention some implication of this, which is uh, which I alluded to a bit earlier, which is what we, what, what, what we, even if you can't buy for the whole population, you know, in some cases our model would suggest buy for the whole population. If countries can't get the budget together to do that, if they can't go to the level that our analysis suggests is optimal, you get a lot of the benefit from, from even from a much smaller program because the, the, um, a lot of the benefit comes from, from reaching these, uh, the health workers, the elderly, maybe a few other groups like other key workers. Okay. What are our findings? Well, you know, this more sophisticated model gives the same intuition on the first bullet point as the, as the back of the envelope calculation. It's in the interest of high income countries, middle income countries, even low income countries to invest, although the low income countries would come in that with you know, fewer candidates and uh, to some extent uh, smaller quantities. The, um, so the high income countries, um, they would order a very large quantity, 12% of their population, enough to vaccinate 12% of their population per month so that they could, um, they could rapidly vaccinate the population. For IADP, it's a, it's a bit lower, but it's still substantial. Um, you know, most of the investment goes to the most advanced candidates, but because you want multiple shots on goal, it turns out to also be worth investing in some of the risky candidates. We estimate the total benefits of this to be um, uh, almost $1,200 billion, the total cost $322 billion. This is a very cost-effective inv investment. Now, obviously, the, you know, there are a lot of assumptions that go into this model. We're still working on it. We're constantly iterating on it. I, you know, we have a list of things that we'd like to improve. Um, but I think we're, we're now at the point where we've got some sense that things are fairly robust. I don't want to say they're going to be robust to all the parameters, 
uh, but they're robust to things that affect the benefits. So, um, you know, I mentioned before the chance that another technology is developed. There are other things that would be um, isomorphic to affecting the benefits. And I think, I think the qualitative results are quite robust to that. Some of the results on the amount you order and so on would be sensitive to where these, um, where the, where, where you start running into scarcity of the, of the supply chain components and prices start going up. But at some level, that's not the decision facing countries right now, because at least right now it's possible to buy at a you know, quite reasonable prices. It could be that the prices are going to go way up once, uh, once we run out of capacity, but, um, but we're not there yet. Okay. Okay. Um, here's something I'm, I'm not going to go through this, but this shows, um, the, you know, some illustrative calculations from our preliminary version of our model we have now. And you can see um, you know, the, the number of candidates that our model suggests is optimal to invest in, uh, the amount. Uh, um, um, and you'll see, if you look to this more, you'd see there's actually a fair amount of heterogeneity. You can, you can see, if you look down at Bolivia and Argentina, you can see Bolivia is going to invest in in uh, more candidates than, uh, sorry, Argentina is going to invest in more candidates than uh, Bolivia would, just as an example of heterogeneity with income. Um, okay. You can also calculate what would happen if all countries cooperated in a centralized program. Now, some of the discussions of centralized programs, um, typically, I would I'd go further than some of the discussions. You know, many of the discussions that say the World Health Organization or within Gave, um, people take the view, which is you know completely um, understandable, and uh, which is that vaccines should be allocated based on health needs, not based on national income. So the first people to get the vaccine should be the health workers, the elderly, and then. Only after those people have been served in all countries, then you could go on to lower risk groups. So that's clearly what would maximize the health benefit of the program. But one thing to note is if you, if you think about a world social planner and you think about the plans for individual countries, those two things aren't going to correspond. And the reason is that the optimal plan for for countries depends on the national income. You know, countries are, are trading off, um, you know, they have many, many needs, particularly at this time of COVID, and they're trading that off. And higher income countries would, if they're just thinking about what's in the narrow interest of their country, they would buy, invest in more candidates and they would invest in greater capacity for each of those candidates. Now, if you, if you're, adding up these individual programs for, for individual countries, and you compare that to the, 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 uh, the policy that would be chosen by a global social planner who's constrained to allocate the vaccines based, based solely on health, we'll see that the centralized plan program is actually smaller. There are larger health benefits because the vaccine is distributed by health need, but there's smaller economic benefits because the rich countries don't get, get as much access. Uh, or as much early access. And I think that raises a question. I mean, there are obviously very important philosophical questions here and ethical questions, but, um, but this also raises questions of incentive compatibility, which is, will, would high income countries join a world program that's going to allocate um, purely based on health need? Because the, what that would mean is um, that people in, Let's take the U.S. for example. You know, the U.S. has launched Operation Warp Speed, and it wants to buy all these doses for the U.S. and it wants to be, you know, it, it wants to be uh, to get those vaccine doses early. And if they, it's not clear that the U.S. would would join a global program if that meant that um, prime age adults in the U.S. were going to have to wait longer to get a vaccine. So there's you know. As I say, there's important ethical and philosophical issues, but just as a, um, there's also a, 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 just a question of would the U.S. join that, and that may be an important issue for, for program design. Now, I think 
we haven't yet done the analysis for incentive compatibility within within regions. So you know, Europe is talking about launching a program. It may be that the incentive compatibility, my guess will be the incentive compatibility issues within Europe are going to be much smaller. If there is a unified program for the region for, for Latin America and the Caribbean, I, I don't, we haven't done that analysis, but I think it'd be interesting to see, is this incentive compatible? Um, it, it, may, it may well turn out that it's, it's not that difficult because some of the poorer countries are also smaller. Um, maybe, maybe something could be done or maybe, um, maybe, maybe that wouldn't be incentive compatible. Um, um, happy to look at it. Yeah. Um, here's another issue to think about. And I would say this is the area where we found maybe the biggest difference from the pneumococcus case, um, which is looking at the optimal combination of what we might call push and pull funding. So pull funding pays for outcomes. So in the case of the pneumococcus vaccine, the funders only offered to pay for a successful vaccine. They didn't, the, the risk had to be taken by the companies. And there's some advantages of that. It means the companies have an incentive to uh, produce quickly, to produce something that's actually practically useful. Um, the disadvantage, which turns out to be you know, particularly big in this case, is that it tends to be expensive. And that's, that's and when I say expensive, that's in terms of the expected price. Obviously, you're paying more if you're only paying for success, but you might think that would all just cancel out um, an, an expectation. But it turns out not to. And the reason is that vaccine candidates differ in the probability of success. Some are more advanced, uh, like the Oxford vaccine. Others are not so advanced. But our analysis suggests that in the case of COVID, because of the enormous economic and health costs, it's worth investing, at least for, it's worth investing in, in, in many, many different candidates. And that means that if you're relying entirely on pull and you're just paying for the, you, you have to try to pull in the marginal candidate. And the marginal candidate might have a much lower probability of success than the, um, than the more advanced candidates. So if you set the price to pull in the candidate that doesn't have such a high probability of success, you're providing rents to the more advanced candidate. And it turns out those are pretty large in, in this case. So it turns out that funding something entirely through Paul would be considerably more expensive than relying on, a, than having a mixture of push and pull with a, a fairly large push component. Um, so you know, we would suggest that this push funding that has cost plus reimbursement for the capacity installation should have a pretty high component. And you know, we, we've done our calculations assuming uh, push funding covers 85% of the costs. And arguably, you know, the US, and, and we don't know the details of those contracts, but it sounds like it might be going even further to 100% of the costs um, up front. Um, you know, this is a judgment call, but I think um, you know, we, and, you know, we make some assumptions and, and so on. It's a somewhat heuristic uh, approach, but we think it's probably good to have some skin in the game um, for the companies themselves. Um, but um, so that's why we, we're not suggesting going to 100 percent, but um, you know, reasonable people could, could differ on this and you know, we can use the model to analyze uh, multiple cases. Okay. Um, our, our model suggests that it's optimal to make quite large investments. I, I went over the slide with the table. Um, quickly. One thing I should emphasize, I noted before that those results are fairly robust to things that would affect the scale of the benefits. Um, but I also wanted to note that you know, one reaction would be, oh, we just can't come up with that, that amount of money and therefore we shouldn't do anything. So I want to emphasize that our analysis suggests that there's still very large benefits from smaller programs. Um, you know, for example, if we look at this at the level of the globe, um, we estimate that you know, it might make sense to spend, this was a slightly earlier version of our analysis, you know, $150 billion overall. But you could still get 90% of the benefits with, with, at half the cost. So um, you know, even if a country, for whatever reason, doesn't go for a full program, it's still worth making some investments in the, 
highest probability of success vaccines and at least enough capacity um, that the, the key uh, populations can be treated quickly. I think our, our, I'll say a few more words on international coordination and cooperation. I touched on that, that before. Um, I argued before that there are pretty big differences between what's optimal for different countries um, and therefore between the global social planner and what's optimal for individual countries. And so that might make it difficult to agree on central global coordination. You know, there are additional issues if a, if a program seeks to redistribute. Um, so one could imagine, a pro so some of the proposals out there, in fact, I think, you know, where we first started, we thought, well, countries can pay at a certain percentage of GDP, and then they would get things allocated based on health needs. That obviously involves a fair amount of redistribution. And look, I would, I would love to see that, um, I think, but it doesn't look like that's incentive compatible for the globe, at least we haven't, have it. I think there's some willingness to pay for the poorest countries, but not to do the full scale redistribution. So I think if, if the region was thinking about something, you could design something that would implicitly redistribute within the region by having countries pay in a uh, percent of GDP. But you could also design things where you know, each country would be purchasing on its own, on its own behalf. You know, Colombia would decide how many, how many, how many different candidates to uh, pre-order vaccine for, what quantities, and, um, and they, would, um, they would pay for those, those doses. Um, you know, one possibility is um, that the, you know, another possible advantage of a global social planner is that they might be able to, to hold down the prices. Um, you could, um, by just ordering, maybe reducing the total order of vaccines so you don't go to the most inelastic part of the, the, um, the s supply schedule. Um, and that, so that would be another, another possible approach. In, in the analysis we just gave with average cost pricing, uh, there'd be no reason to do that. But if you had marginal cost pricing, it might be the global social planner might, might try to hold down the, the, the price a bit. Um, what measures for international cooperation might be feasible? Well, one thing I'd like to emphasize, um, some of these discussions are implicitly comparing um, um, what happens if each country is on its own to what happens if all countries are in a centralized plan. Well, each country on its own relying entirely on domestic production. That is actually terrible. That's terrible not just for wouldn't only be terrible for, I mean, obviously it'd be terrible for Honduras, but also be terrible for Brazil, but also be terrible for the U.S. You know, you really want multiple shots on goal here. And the U.S., you know, even a country with as big a vaccine industry as the U.S., they're going to want access to vaccines developed elsewhere. There are international supply chains for these. So export bans and autarky, um, even just a minimal, um, you know, that, um, Getting away from that is really, uh, I think, a, a very minimal uh, uh, object for international cooperation. But I think there are other area, areas where international cooperation might be feasible. One is an R&D. Getting uh, funding the basic R&D and the trials is in some sense a global public good. CEPI is doing some of that, and, and I think there's plenty of room to, to do more. Um, probably don't have time to get into this now, but it's the supply chain capacity is you know, trying to improve the, the, say, create more capacity to produce bioreactors. That probably won't help in the short run, but we could be facing a, a situation in which um, you know, the short run candidates don't succeed or they do succeed, but then we need to keep up, we need to further expand capacity because, um, um, and expanding capacity now in, in the supply chain and say firms that produce bioreactors, I think would be valuable and would be, and I think there are reasons why that should, could, should perhaps be done at a, either at a, at a global level or, or possibly at a regional level. There's also possible insurance benefits. We don't know, right now, we don't know which candidates, which countries will be most affected when the vaccine becomes available. Maybe by working together, we can agree that we'll, you know, say the countries in the region might say, well, we'll purchase through PAHO and we'll allow PAHO some flexibility in prioritizing who gets vaccine first um, so that um, 
so that whichever countries in the midst of a, a severe epidemic then can, uh, as a hotspot then, can get the vaccine first. Or obviously this could be done at the global level through the COVAX facility um, or, or Gavi. Okay, lots of, lots of open questions. Let me just uh, uh, summarize some of our results and, and turn to, to one, I think, open question. Um, yeah. What's clear is the huge benefits of accelerating a vaccine mean that even if the chance of vaccine success were much less than I think most people estimate, um, um, it's still worthwhile taking these bets. Um, so yes, these are risky bets, but they're, they're clearly, um, it's like insurance. It's a bet you want to take. Um, and probably want to order fairly large capacity and diversify across multiple candidates. That's not only true for rich countries, but certainly for middle income countries and even for low income countries. Um, I think you know, we think that there's some important differences with the pneumococcus case and that um, the optimal contract in this case will take largely take the form of an upfront payment to the firms to install capacity in exchange for an option to purchase um, at, a, at a price that provides you know, some polar incentives. Now that does require an upfront commitment at a time when countries are facing you know, huge financial pressures, and um, and you know, that's a that's that's easy for an economist to say, but it's a tough to that this is worthwhile based on economic analysis. But actually, coming up with the money is is harder. And um, I think there's potentially, you know, this, uh, obviously uh, we've got the experts here, but uh, you know, I think our analysis would suggest there might well be a role for multilateral development banks. In helping provide the financing for the for middle-income countries, which are currently um, not not being that don't already have the, the purchases lined up that some of the high-income countries do, and that can't count on the funded portion of the COVAX vaccine to address their needs. So, uh, would love to discuss that and uh, and other issues uh, in the rest of the talk. Thank you very much, uh, Professor, and uh, it's been a fascinating presentation. I know that we're short on time, and I don't know if, if either Juan Camilo uh, or Susan want to add anything. I would perhaps ask them, and then I will just quickly have perhaps time for just two questions. Susan or Juan Camilo? Hey, I think we can go ahead with questions. Okay. No, so, so, so one of the questions is, you know, if, if anything, what COVID has taught us is that international cooperation really hasn't worked. I mean, every country has looked after itself. And, uh, you know, there is all these variables out there. If you had the magic wand, now that we're, you know, the reality is that in most of Latin America, with the exception of Brazil, uh, I haven't seen any decision by any one country. In the case of Brazil, they made the, 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 the deal with uh, AstraZeneca and, and Oxford, uh, and they already set up a, a kind of a tiered approach of the numbers of vaccines they would do. Uh, what would you say if you had the magic wand? Uh, you, have, you talked about the centralized approach, you talked about the push and pull. Where, where would you say is the best way to put this together? Putting aside, of course, the low-income countries which you outlined them there. Uh, which basically Gavi is going to try to work through them, but the, the bulk of the world today uh, is middle income and upper middle income countries in terms of population at least. Right. So look, if I were a policymaker in the region, I would be trying to go out and do the same deals that, uh, that the rich countries have done. Um, and you know, which way that's done, I think is Look, my personal preference would be to do that through some sort of international cooperation. I think that offers some advantages. So um, you know, they could go to the COVAX facility, which has the self-pay component. Um, um, it's not fully clear what all the design features of that would be. PAHO obviously has a lot of experience in, in purchasing vaccines, so that could be done through PAHO. Uh, they could do it on their, on their own. I think that's a, I'm not an expert in the legal aspects or on the, I don't have a stake among the different uh, you know, institutional players. Um, but um, um, I, this is not just a hypothetical plan with exotic financing. This is 
this is what countries, high income countries are already doing. And I actually had it known that Brazil had already done it. But if Brazil is doing it, I think that's totally understand why they're, why they're making that decision. Um, and you know, I think for those countries that are having problems with, with financing this, I would, as I was saying at the end, I think that it does make sense to go to multilateral development banks and to, to seek financing to help, help make these purchases. And um, um, so. And, and, and Professor, do you believe that, that uh, as Diffie and others have suggested, that start at least with a commitment to the equivalent of, let's say, 20% of one country's population, which in the case of Latin America would be roughly speaking 130 million uh, uh, vaccines. Uh, and that would basically take care, as you correctly pointed out, I mean, the, the obvious is the health workers, but then the people at risk, and then gradually move on. That, that would be, in general, the, the kind of model that you would follow? Yes. I mean, look, I think there's a, there's a case for even, I think there's, our model would suggest there would be the national self-interest of many countries to go larger than that. Now, there is a question, if everybody tries to do that, is that going to leave enough vaccine to go around? Um, and maybe there's a case for, you know, some sort of uh, system where countries would cooperate, order the vaccine, have that go to the places that most need it, and obviously start with the people who have the most, uh, most health needs. I don't know, Susan, Camilla, do you want to jump in on that question? Or so any just other? Mention one thing, which is about that number of 20%. I think that is a great thing, but 20% delivered over two years and 20% delivered in six months are completely different things. And whenever these countries are trying to sign these deals, they should be worried also about how quickly that 20% or whichever number they want to buy, how quickly it's going to be delivered. Well, Professor, talk to us because th there's a number of areas here, and this has to do, of course, with the, with the push uh, as it relates to production capacity. I, I mean, just things like vials. I mean, right. to produce, uh, you know, 100 million vaccines is one thing, to produce 7 billion is another. And, and I think right. from just behavioral economics, which you know well, I imagine the minute that you say everybody's going to want a vaccine and you say, wait a minute, this is the order in which you get it. It creates all kinds of, of tensions throughout the society. People will find a way to go around the line because they want to be able to say, now I'm normal, I have a vaccine. Walk, walk us through the supply challenges in the production and the things that you think countries can do. Because clearly, in terms of just PPE, uh, what we've seen everywhere in Latin America is, I never imagined to see, I know of at least seven different projects of production of uh, uh, ventilators, uh, some on, on uh, uh, 3D printing, others on hybrids, etc. But the reality is that here we are, every country had to produce their own PPE because you had all these huge shortages. And now we learn again here in the United States even that some hospitals, not all, but are having challenges with PPE. So before, right. before Michael answers, maybe I, let me just underscore something that maybe went, goes by a little fast because we're so focused on it. And that is that the thing that we're suggesting countries sign up for is accelerated capacity expansion. Um, and so, but one could imagine that mistakes could be made where you say, I'm signing up for, for these vaccines, but you don't have sufficient power in your contract that actually the, the companies are in fact creating the capacity to meet your needs. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's, it, the headlines are, you know, I've got 200 million doses, but what, what, what you've got to care about is, am I getting, is it actually credible that the company itself is going to be delivered in those 200 million doses quickly? So I think that, you know, behind the scenes, you need to be thinking about milestone payments and you need to be thinking about ensuring that there's a, actually a plan and that the capacity is being expanded, which might mean signing up more contract facilities and so on. And if other people are signing up later, that they're also continuing to expand their capacity. And then the details of all of that are making sure that the vials are there and you know all of the other components um, are, are available. So it's not just saying I've got three bioreactors, but they have to have a plan for all of it. And so you know, it, for the leading companies and, and 
you know, the ones that with the most experience, I think you, it's not going to be so hard to write those contracts and for them to actually deliver on them. But you can worry that once you start managing, um, you know, the newer companies or companies with less experience, they might have good intentions, but not actually deliver on time. And you'd have very little recourse if you get there and they're like, oops, sorry, like, oh, my fire jet isn't ready on time. Like your house isn't ready on time. You know, my vaccines aren't ready on time. You're, you know, you, you, if, they, if they're not ready, they're not ready. They're, there's not a lot you can do. So trying to, you, you really are going to have to make sure that the steps are followed to get there so that you're not sort of surprised at the end. So, but Michael, why don't you maybe take the question maybe a little more directly? No, I think that's great. I completely agree with everything Susan, Susan just said. Um, um, you know, the other, you know, these, um, you know, what are some of the important components? You know, one, as you mentioned, the, the delivery mechanisms, the vials. Um, talking to people at CEPI, I think there was a lot of concern about that. The people at CEPI feel like they've got, they've made a lot of progress on that. I think they have. Um, one, um, another is bioreactors. Uh, there are also things called adjuvants, which uh, boost the efficacy of, of certain types of vaccines. I think one thing that's, some of these inputs um, could work for many different, most clearly if you think about the, the vials, that could work for many different vaccines. And when I argued one of the strongest cases for international cooperation was for the supply chain components, and we don't know which vaccine will succeed, and there, I think there's something, if we think that there's implicit political pr uh, pressures that make it very hard to be seen as profiteering, particularly for a multi-product firm that may be producing bioreactors, but that's a very small sh share of their, of their total business. Um, if you think about a firm like that, are they going to want to build an entire factory to increase production of bioreactors when it may be just a very short run increase in demand, and then their factory goes idle again. They may not want to do it because the only way they may be able to justify that financially is by raising their prices a lot, but that may expose, expose them to political, um, you know, political backlash. So I think just as we argued for vaccines, it makes sense for the countries or global institutions to sign contracts for, um, to, to pay for the capacity itself I think for some of these supply chain components, it makes sense to go to the glass vial manufacturers and just pay them to increase capacity to build a to build extra factories and similarly for bioreactors, et cetera. And actually we've seen that. You know, the US government is going out to corning the glassware manufacturer and paying for production increase in production of the specialized glass used for vials. Um, so um, I think there are benefits from international coordination on that, and, and we could get more of that. Um, but um, so, you know, these are thinking through those challenges is important, and the, to the extent we can expand capacity, we're going to reduce those problems. Um, but it's it's definitely you know in the interest of each country to start signing up for supply now. I think uh, at least for the most vulnerable elements of their populations. And then I guess when you sign the contracts also, they do need to have supply chain plans uh, right. and, and you need to be tracking those plans. Um, and this whole thing that Mike, Michael mentioned in his talk, like how terrible autarky is. So when we were just using that to, to flesh out what that means, you know, we're going to have components of the supply chain in all different countries and we're just going to have a repeat of the PPE problems if we're not careful about it. So, um, and then that can uh, blunt the incentives to invest. Like if, if you're a country and you're thinking, I'm gonna invest, but actually the, the, the vaccine candidates supply chain plan depends on inputs from other countries, which I'm not sure I can rely on, then maybe you hesitate to, to enter into your original agreement. So one place where multilateral discussions among you know, finance ministers or others from each country to sort of get some commitments in place that, hey, you know, it, we're, 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 none of us are going to invest sufficiently in this, in this pandemic if we can't trust the contracts that we write. And it, it may be that in certain settings that that entails actually thinking about, well, if I'm going to go to another country to get my glass, maybe I need to make sure that that country that's manufacturing the glass is also, has also got enough glass for themselves. 
um, because they're going to be less tempted to cause problems for you if they haven't been short-sighted themselves. And that, again, is a benefit of multilateral discussions that, you know, it's really especially important in the countries that are doing production that those countries have sufficiently have, have their own house in order well enough that they're not going to be tempted to sort of disrupt other countries' plans. I know our, our time has run out. I know there's a lot of questions out there, but I really want to thank uh, 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 Professor Michael Kramer, Susan, and Juan Camilo. The reality is that after listening to you, uh, this is a model, uh, regardless, where you have to take out a lot of risk from private companies. It will lead to discussions in many countries if you should begin as a, uh, as a national security issue to have your own type of larger manufacturing going forward. If we believe that more uh, diseases like this are going to happen in the future as you build up a health system throughout the world. But uh, really, thank you very much. You give us a lot of food for thought. This is an extremely complex issue, but clearly our role, as you suggested, is uh, fundamental. And we hope to, to continue to work with you and get all your advice as we go forward and look at the, the models that you develop. So again, Professor, uh, thank you very much. Susan and Juan Camilo, thank you very much for your time. Wonderful. Thank you. Very much enjoyed it.